It is commencement season nationwide and historically black colleges prepare to say farewell to distinguished graduates uh, and to welcome in the fall new students. And part of that welcoming committee, obviously, is college and university presidents. And here to talk with us today, one of the deans of the HBCU presidency, uh, one of the guys responsible uh, for a cohort and a programmatic uh, approach to developing executive talent at historically black colleges and universities. I'm talking about Wiley College President Herman Felton. Big brother, uh, always a pleasure, man. Hey, Jared, it is always good to see you, man. I appreciate the uh, friendship and the fellowship, although it is virtual. Um, it's, good, <laughs> it's good to see you, and it's also good to be seen, my brother. Absolutely, man. And we, we honor your time, uh, especially to talk about this subject, uh, the Higher Education Leadership Foundation. Um, so for a number of years, you've ushered through a number of cohorts. Uh, you and folks from all over the HBCU community having real conversations and real training modules uh, for, for brothers and sisters who want to come through the academy uh, with the aspiration and the pathway to becoming a, a president or a chancellor. And now you guys have big news uh, that extends that operation um, in a really meaningful way. Talk to us about that and what you think it will do for the sector and for a lot of the people coming along in this pathway. You know, when we started this work in 2015, Jared, it was really about um, doing some work that would allow for us to um, have a space where people who were really interested in serving at our institutions had a place to work. Um, and health morphed into something that honestly we had no idea it would. Um, it spoke to the fact that there was a missing piece um, and, um, and we think we spoke to that. So since 2015, we've had uh, 10 cohorts, our 11th and 12th respectfully uh, will be June 3rd and 4th at um, Wiley College. Um, the Lambda and Mu cohorts, um, over 340 fellows from all across the nation, 65 HBCUs uh, have been represented. Uh, we get an opportunity to fellowship and pour into those who aspire to lead. We make no bones about it. We have no idea how to make presidents. And so that's not what we do. Um, <laughs> if your desire is to come to health, because you want to be a college president, great, but we don't offer that training. Mm -hmm. We will, however, help uh, identify gaps that you may have in your leadership ethos and skills uh, to strengthen those so that if that opportunity presents itself, um, you're ready to lead as a leader. Um, what we have been constantly doing is evolving. Uh, we went to a podcast. Um, we have a journal that we're releasing uh, I'm not the greatest of writers, uh, but I presented materials only to find out that my voice wasn't ready to be heard by someone else's standards at that time. So we thought we'd produce a journal, create a journal for Black colleges and leadership and, and scholarship. Uh, in addition to that, we came up with this notion uh, a couple of years ago about making sure that we left the 3.3 life expectancy for presidents, HBCU presidencies. Uh, and when you, if you study the presidency, you know that it appears that some of those presidents could have been salvaged um, if we had um, different skill sets, different tools. Uh, and those who come outside of the sector don't fare necessarily well as opposed to those who have come up through the sector. Mm -hmm. But all of our institutions really deserve to have strong leadership. Uh, and that leadership needs uh, toolboxes or tools in their toolbox that allow them to handle the myriad of challenges. So we created the Presidential Leadership Institute, which we're really excited uh, that our first cohort, the inaugural cohort, will go through down at Florida Memorial in uh, less than a month. I want. I really want to go back to something you just said about the 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 individuals who come through the HBCU network versus those who come from without from outside yeah. of it. Because one of the things you hear in our communities all the time is, you keep recycling presidents, you keep recycling presidents. And one of the things that we don't understand is what may have been not so good of a fit at one institution may be a wonderful fit at another HBCU. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about presidential chancellor fit? And, and how individuals can identify it, and more importantly, how can the public identify it so they don't feel like it's a quote-unquote recycling of talent from one HBCU to another? 
Well, you know, one thing, Jared, is everybody doesn't have all the information, right? Mm -hmm. So when you don't have all the information, you really have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, those who are looking from the outside. Uh, but fit matters. Just as you go buy a pair of shoes uh, for longevity and purpose, um, you should probably be applying the same thing. You want to kick the tires around. You want to ask questions. Uh, you know, we try to encourage people to not chase a presidency, but to be in a position to where your leadership allows you to lead. Um, and if you're looking for a presidency, any old place will do, right? Um, you've got to understand, uh, I talked to Walter Kimbrough, Hayward Strickland, Jimmy Jenkins, um, I talked to a myriad of people before I took my presidency, Michael Sorrell, and they gave me questions that I had no idea to ask, right? Because I did not want to be the last picture on the wall, nor did I want my first presidency to be my last presidency. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be equipped with asking tough questions. I wanted to know if Sachs was having any concerns about board governance. Um, I wanted to know whether HCM2 was coming around a corner mm. or any type of things that would preclude you from having um, the ability to draw federal financial aid. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a private guy, so I know private HBCU is my space, and that's what I mean by private. Public is not my space, mm -hmm. um, and I, but I know that because the missions of privates resonate to me more than the missions of publics. They are powerful and wonderful, but I like the autonomy, the freedom uh, to be able to change directions in a very nimble way. And I'm not suggesting that they can't do that at Publix, um, but I just, the private fit fits better for me. So I knew Jerry going in that I wanted to be a president at a private college. Mm -hmm. um, and so people need to look at fit and they need to understand if the church ethos are congruent with who you are as an individual because if they're not you're in trouble um the culture matters as well mm -hmm. right we've got to figure out how we have presidents that can evolve the culture that is so important to institutions and alums and people who work at them while making the these institutions relevant um and i think the one thing that is a challenge, Jared, is that we define different as deficient. And mm -hmm. it's not, it's just right. different, it's a different culture. And I think that's why you have people that might be quote unquote recycled. But what people don't understand is that the cycle of life dictates what boards are really looking for. Right. Where is that presidency um, or that institution at the time of the president that they're looking for. Are they malleable? Do, do those skill sets fit with what's needed for this stretch assignment? Mm -hmm. Or if you're coming in in a coasting posture um, where money's there, uh, academic rigor, all those things are there. Uh, or if you're following a giant, you need a different type of leader to follow a giant. You need humility. You need people who are not opposed to making sure that that giant's stature, his or her stature, uh, is is not tarnished or or you know uh, you don't have a problem with them the the ghost of that giant still being around so there are different things that people have to look at Jared and not just oh there's a vacancy and why are they bringing this person and that person and he's being recycled well he might have a skill set that is needed at that time that the casual fan may have no idea that that's what the board is looking for. That, that's such a, a critical point, man. And, and you're, you're basically running this interview for me because <laughs> my questions are feeding off you. I mean, how do you define for some of the people who are coming through now, particularly younger professionals, mm -hmm. the difference between an anointing and an assignment, meaning that in our culture, we look for leaders who who, are, who could be lifers. We want a Benjamin Mays, a Bill Harvey, a Earl Richardson, a, a, you know, a Humphreys, you know, a, a Jimmy Jenkins. We Jimmy want Jenkins. people to be there for a long time. Yeah. But you have talked about publicly and privately that sometimes you have to be there for a specific time with a specific skill, specific objective, and then move on. Yeah. Is that is that era of anointed leadership over with and should boards and, and candidates, executive candidates, be more cognizant of I got a job to do and then I get out of here? 
I think it's um, it, it's a it's a hodgepodge of all those things, Jared. Right? Um, in sixteen, actually in fourteen, I was appointed president at Wilberforce, and after understanding the magnitude of the need and looking at my skill set, I knew that I didn't have what it what it what it took to get Wilberforce to where it needed to be, mm -hmm. and then. Um, a young lady came in and took the place to where it needed to be. And so that the two years later, I came, was appointed again at the very same place. I knew that I was ready for more prepared then than I was in 14. I was more prepared in 16. Um, and I ran that race for two years. Um, and quite honestly, Jer, I was exhausted. Um, mm -hmm. It was a, it was an arduous task, um, and I want to commend all those before me at Wilberforce um, and my predecessor, Algenia Freeman, for running as, as hard as she could and as fast as she could to elevate the institution, to take it off of um, a status of uncertainty to a very solid footing. She did that, and I mm -hmm. ran for two years. Uh, and then behind me uh, comes Tony Pinkard, who was my provost, and he's been running. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew in that instance what you just saw there, what in, in that conversation, Jared, was me recognizing one, that at a particular time when I wanted to lead, I knew that I didn't have the skill set to leave. Mm -hmm. And I was honest enough with myself to push. Uh, secondly, I felt I was more ready. And thirdly, I felt when the time for my, an opportunity at Wiley came, I felt I had did what I could do, ran as far and fast as I could, and passing the baton was going to be a great thing, uh, and it was time for me to leave. Um, I studied culture. Uh, I came behind a giant Hayward Strickland, who hey, was Strick, there for yep. 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so when you have people like Strickland and Beckley and Yancey, uh, there are people outside the spectrum don't give the spectrum don't give them their just desserts. Jimmy Jenkins has been a college president for thirty years at HBCUs. Mm -hmm. You cannot sneeze at that. Mm -hmm. You can't sneeze at the work that Yancey did. That um, my sister, who was at Saint Augustine's, uh, so Diane Broadley Super. You can't mm -hmm. sneeze at the work that these people have done. They they figured out. When was it time to leave the park, right? They stayed as long as they could, gave as much as they could. Um, and in some cases, to answer your question more directly, there are anointings that happen and appointments that happen. Mm -hmm. Case in point, if the newly aspiring president now got somewhere and sat down for a minute, right and established a tenure a culture a track record um it's easy for you to to leap from there but mm -hmm. people i find in our work with health not all of them but a great majority of people are doing it the right way uh and there's no right way to get to the presidency quote unquote let me let me say it that way people are doing it in a way that allows him to be more malleable when search firms and those come uh, mm. for an institution say yes. And then there are some people who get with the right person at the right time and they find themselves, um, boom, uh, appointed. Uh, anointed, I think for me is you find a person who you see as a sponsor and you see a protege and you say, this person has it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have it to be the presidency, but they deliver on fronts, they're loyal, they build consensus, and they can handle a stretch assignment. More than that, though, what is important is that they can comfortably talk about their skill sets from a lived experience. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're just the VP for academic affairs. Do you know anything about student affairs and the nexus between academic and, and student? Do you have any idea what the legal department deals with on a day-to-day -day basis? Have you mm -hmm. ever asked to be a part of a million dollar gift or write a proposal? 
Mm -hmm. right? Building that um, cachet is really important. And oftentimes people are one trick minded. I'm good at the craft that I'm in. And what we're finding nowadays is that boards are looking for people with diverse backgrounds that have a myriad of uh, skill sets that can really be reflective uh, in a leadership uh, of people who are leading these complex organizations. Let's talk about the the universe of training, right? Because health is has quickly emerged as this invaluable resource. <clears throat> excuse me, for brothers and sisters coming into leadership. Mm -hmm. But they but they come behind programs like uh, MLI with Askew and Charlie Nelms and, and now uh, can, Mary Science. Jerry, can we stop and talk about MLI and how that came about? <laughs> Absolutely, because I don't think people know that there were black presidents, men and women who put money together out of their mm -hmm. own pockets to create the MLI, mm -hmm. right? And those were HBCU presidents. A great deal of them were HBCU presidents and they knew that there was a need. So that I, I just wanted to touch on that, <laughs> uh, that what health is doing is not new. People have been doing this forever. It's just the cycle of life and we're the crazy ones who picked up the, <laughs> the baton and decided to do this work for free. That's right. who we are, right? And, but, and, it's, and it's, no, it's adding in a big way because yeah. MLI and Hamptons Leadership Institute and NAFIO Presidential yeah. Training, um, yeah. these things have all built and now it's building towards health. And now we see a new addition to that. This emerges yeah. out of Clark Atlanta. Yes. What, 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 what does that... What does it look like from your perspective in the in the landscape of how do we get people trained up, skilled up and smartened up for what it takes to be a president? And does that is there would you see a, a space where it's like, OK, we, we're pretty big now or, no. or is it you can't get big enough? No, no, you can't. I OK, mean, the Marine Corps, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force and the Coast Guard protect and defend the United States of America. Right. There are nine Greek letter organizations. There were eight before, mm -hmm. right? Um, excellence makes way for its gifts, mm -hmm. right? And the PWI space has CIC, AGB, ASCU, ACE, Harvard programs, mm -hmm. and everybody else training the hundreds of thousands of aspirants who desire to lead. Our space deserves excellence. HBCUs and the progeny of slaves who uh, traverse on those grounds and labor in those vineyards, those sacred vineyards, we deserve options. We mm -hmm. deserve a vast array of modalities to help us get to where we want to go. I'm excited that Clark Atlanta has a program uh, that espouses to create presidents. That's not what health does. We're, mm -hmm. we're about leadership and development. And mm -hmm. so I think having a place that espouses to push uh, presidencies into the pipeline, that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, while it was not an intention of health, uh, five of us have become HBCU presidents and one uh, a community college president. Mm -hmm. Maybe 15, 20 percent of the 300 have ascended to vice presidents, executive vice presidents, chief operating officers, you know, so the work um, will make room for promotion. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the the more training opportunities that the 10,000 plus administrators at HBCUs have to be the best that they can be, which translates to being the best for our institutions, the more the merrier. So I think it's great that they have a program. And, uh, you know, one of our founders, George French, who mm -hmm. became president at Clark Atlanta University, um, they had a program before he got there. I don't know that it was codified in the way that it is now. Um, so that that probably has more to do with his imprint um, mm -hmm. and his comfortability with leadership. Let's shift real quick. Um, HBCUs are, are announcing fall reopening plans. Mm -hmm. A lot of institutions saying, you know, there are going to be mandates for vaccines. <clears throat> We're still trying to work things out with federal guidelines, with state and city guidelines on health and gathering and all that. 
you were among the first leaders to say, man, we shutting this thing down last yeah. March. Mm-hmm. Um, and we talked then and you wrote then about what does that decision entail? A masterful piece on, you know, how the board is working, how the administration is working, how we communicate with students. Mm-hmm. All that's laid out there, uh, you know, and I encourage people to go read it. Now that we're coming back, mm-hmm. what is it like for your your reentry strategy? Mm-hmm. Knowing that here's what it took to get out of it. Now, how, is there any is there any headache or any static when it says let's get back into it the way we used to do it? We're sending up a smoke signal and tell them to come be all faithful. <laughs> come on. <laughs> um, you know, that's a good question. I think the intentionality that was deployed while they were departing is is required for their return. Um, and we can't wait for them to return. We held our commencement May 1st on the grounds of Wiley College uh, in person. And it just felt so amazing, Jared. Mm-hmm. Uh, have our students back on campus and they would not been since March uh, 23rd to be exact of 2020. Mm-hmm. So it was amazing to have them back on the campus and you know we're taking the precautions um, tomorrow. Um, we have what is today the sixth yep. today is the sixth. Mm-hmm. We actually had a vaccination um, drive on our campus. We had the Moderna va- vaccine. Uh, and I'd say about 70% of our faculty and staff are vaccinated. Mm. Uh, we're moving in that direction. I sent a, a soft letter out uh, to the campus and um, to um, our students, um, encouraging them strongly um, to get vaccinated. If we're not talking about um, religious ideology and medical impediments, um, that vaccine, uh, people really need to take a strong look at, at getting that vaccination. Uh, I'm fully vaccinated, um, did not think once about it. And, you know, I lost my mother January 25th of this year. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I would give anything for her to have had the opportunity to get the vaccination, mm-hmm. and she didn't have that, uh, we lost her to COVID. And so um, I, I share that personal story to folks uh, in hopes of trying to get them to, to, to really uh, be vaccinated because it is a life uh, changer, a lifesaver. Uh, and so we're going to probably recommend, strongly encourage at the very least that all of our students and faculty uh, are, are vaccinated upon return to campus. You know, and, and then just to round out the conversation, and, and again, we appreciate you, brother, and, and even sharing, you know, personal insight into why it's so important the way that we get back and not just that we get back. Yes, um, you and I have talked privately. And while I'm always the master of panic, you're always the one that's like, hey, you know, it's just, just hold on. Like, <laughs> it ain't as bad as you think. And so I, I and part of that conversation has been around what leadership will look like in the future. I, there are a lot of presidents that have announced that they're going to be retiring. Yeah. There's a lot of transition that's going to take place. A lot of boards are going to go crazy um, around money and enrollment and things that are going to be look different because of the pandemic. Yeah. yeah, You are more optimistic than I am. What, what gives you the most optimism about where HBCUs will be fall 21 and five years to come? You know, Jared, it is because um, make no mistake about it. You, you've interviewed more presidents than probably any journalist ever. And so you talk to some of the same people and you know, I get to talk to these folks um, and debt, financial resources or the lack thereof and the management of them is arguably one of the main um, predictors uh, for a success for a president or not. Mm-hmm. COVID, uh, while many things have been bad about it, there have been some blessings in disguise. Mm-hmm. I share the belief that COVID has made uh, the runway clearer for some very long tenures. Mm-hmm. You talk about wiping out 60, 70, 80, 90, 98% of your debt at an institution. Now you move from chaos albeit organized to innovation. The mm-hmm. mind can't operate in chaos and innovation at the same time. I don't care who you are, mm-hmm. right? 
But now you have some people who their main priority, the thing that they deal with on a daily basis is not debt. That's removed. Oh, now I get to be innovative. Oh, now I get to stretch the vision. Now I get to implement the vision unpa unimpaired. That's a big thing. The second is, is I think we will benefit from students who have been cooped up in the crib, mm. right? Folks mm -hmm. are ready to come home. Um, and I think campuses have done a really good job at making upgrades while students have been away, even while students have been there. Uh, COVID has been a blessing in many disguise, in, in many different ways. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about all the people that come through health, uh, all the people who um, are aspiring to lead, and I, I've only met three or 400 of them, but I can tell you the future is bright. I was talking to a young vice president um, who had a meteoric rise to the vice presidency, and he was lamenting about, I'm ready to be a president, I'm ready to be a president. So we talked about the gaps in his resume and why mm -hmm. he's really not ready to be a president. But I wanted to sagaciously admonish him, if you will, uh, about um, the meteoric rise that you had to the vice presidency won't be the same to the presidency because every vice president just about on every HBCU campus just about wants to be the president. Mm -hmm. Throw them in the pot. Mm -hmm. Seemingly, there are a few board members on every board that wants to be a president. <laughs> <laughs> Throw them in the pot. Right. <laughs> there are legislators, state and federal, that want to be an HBCU president. Throw mm -hmm. them in the pot. Mm -hmm. There are VPs uh, at PWIs, all 3,300 of them, throw them in the pot. Mm -hmm. There are so many people vying for these jobs, which means that in most cases, colleges are going to get it right and find some really good talent to lead the places, mm -hmm. right? And so I think from my perspective, I see nothing but um, brightness in front of us. I am also cautiously um, optimistic um, in knowing that things turn really quick. Yep. We've given you all this money. No more woe is me. What are you going to do now? Mm -hmm. And that is why we have to be in a posture that says we're not thinking about now or 2021, 2022. We're thinking about 2030. Mm -hmm. We have long term strategic planning. And in talking to most of my colleagues, man, they're all over it. And that's why I'm really excited and optimistic about it. And the last thing I'll say, and I tie this to the, pre, the, the Presidential Leadership Institute, which we partner with United Negro College Fund mm -hmm. uh, with a grant that was powered by Kresge Foundation. We have eight presidents coming who are less than 18 months in their tenure. Jackson State, West Virginia State University, Russ College, Morris Brown, uh, Voorhees, uh, Lamont Owen, Payne. And they're coming down and they're going to be taught by, you know, the likes of Henry Tisdale, um, Charlie Nelms, Hayward Strickland, McCole Abdul, not taught but shared with um, Rosalind Clark artists. Um, they're going to be shared, poured into, and get an opportunity to share with each other uh, in a way that is um, really pretty special. And we're happy at Health to be doing that work. Um, and so that's another reason why, because the more of us that get connected to the space, we know who to call when stuff pops off. We're able to tap into the vast libraries uh, that HBCUs have. Uh, by way of personnel to help us solve some of the problems that we have.